This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural text today comes from Psalm 139. The psalm is here crying out to God, saying these words, Psalm 139, verse 1 through 6. O Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand talking today from the subject of relational discernment relational discernment this is about life and life is about relationships if you really had to reduce Christianity down to one word it would be about relationships let me just say this to you that whenever the devil wants to mess up your life hear me carefully he will mess up your relationships he goes after your relationship not your diamond ring not your stock portfolio. He goes after your relationships. When he wants to mess up your life, he wants to mess up your relationship, your, your, your partner in life, your child, your son, your daughter, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister. He goes after your relationships, what is dear to your heart because the real essence of it is about relationships. And this begins here in Psalm 139 because it really begins to teach us that our greatest relationship outside of our relationship with God is our relationship with self. And so here the psalmist is saying, God, search me, search me, search me. Search me, God, you know me. You know my thought before I think it. You know what I'm going to say before I say it. Lord, I, I, I need you, I need you. And I love how Jesus summarized the totality of the law for us in Mark chapter 12. Notice verse 30 and 31. Notice what he says to us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and all your strength. And then he said to us, the second is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. I want you to understand this. Christianity is both a religion and a relationship. There are some people that say, you know, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. It is a religion. May I serve you notice it is the largest religion in the world. Jesus is Lord. Every knee. It's, it's, not, it's an exclusive religion. It doesn't say that all roads lead to heaven. It says Jesus is the way. And that if you come by any other means. It's just, I didn't make the rules. It's, it's, it's an exclusive religion. It's an exclusive club. I'm sorry. But it allows everybody. God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. So Christianity is both a religion and a relationship. It is a religion and a relationship. It's a religion and a relationship with God first, relationship with self, and then a relationship with others because if your self is twisted, all of your relationships are going to be jacked up. So Jesus is reducing to us all of the 630 laws that the Jewish people have to try to struggle to remem remember and keep. And he says, Listen, hey, hey, if you just get these two, you'll be okay. Love God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. Love God with everything you've got, with every fiber of your being, from your inside to your outside. Love God with everything that you've got. Put your focus and, and attention on God. And then love yourself because you have to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if you don't know how to love yourself, you won't know how to properly love your, your neighbor. And so that means that self-care is important. 
There are some people that just think that they ought to just love other people to the neglect of themselves and then you run yourself in the ground and now you're sick and now you're weak and the very people you've been serving are not thinking about you. So it's, it's called self-care for a reason because we have to do that. And I, I love the words of this wonderful woman, Doris Mortman, that said, until you make peace with who you are, you will never be content with what you have until you make peace with who you are you will never be content with what you have and there are some people that just think that if they could just win something big enough that, that to, to fulfill all of their dreams that they'll be happy no 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 until you are content with who you are you will never be content with what you have until you love yourself you will not know how to love others and not only will you not know how to love others, you won't even know how to receive love properly from others that are sent into your life uh, to love you. I, I want you to realize that uh, it's hard to love yourself when you have been shamed. It's hard to love yourself when you've been abused. It's hard to, to love yourself when you've been neglected. It's hard to love yourself when you've been abandoned. It's hard to love yourself when you have been molested. If you've been traumatized, it's sometimes hard to love yourself. But I want you to be assured of this, that at every stage of your life, even when you have trouble loving yourself, God sends people into your life at every stage of your life who have the grace to be able to love you in spite of you. And it's hard to receive that love, and so I want you to be able to ask God this in a simple prayer. Just look up right now toward heaven and just say these words, Lord, help me to see your love through others that you have for me. It's just that simple. You just ask God to help you to see his love for you through others. You wonder how God could have somebody to love you? God will manifest his love through human beings. He loves us, yes, but we express that love here in the earth realm. That's why people fall in love with people who are in prison. It's not this, uh, negating the fact that they've committed a crime. But do you know that God can have people to love them in spite of that? I was sitting on the jury of a man that had committed double murder, and I'm watching his mother there with unconditional love for her child. I watched her get on the witness stand and said, please don't, don't lock up my, my, my baby. I gave him a double life sentence. I'm like, your baby took other, two other people's lives. I'm, I'm looking out for some, two other mothers who are crying today. And, and so she said, he's a good child. Tell that to the other women who lost their child but God yet still had somebody even murderers need love robbers need love dope addicts need love so God will ordain people on your journey that have a grace to love you that is a manifestation of the love of God even when you have trouble loving yourself but you have to ask God God help me open my eyes so that I can see your love for me through others and you'll be surprised, God will have it at every juncture of your life. At your lowest point, God will have somebody and put you on their heart. Somebody who will still have the ability to love you. It's, it's wonderful here that the psalmist in Psalm 139 is crying out to God because it is a revelation to us that God knows us better than we know ourselves. Sometimes we do stupid stuff, we don't even know why we do what we do. We don't even understand why we keep going back to stuff that's not good for us. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And that's what I'm telling you. If you need to really know yourself, it, it, it always perplexes me when people uh, start saying, well, I'm trying to find myself. You're like, no, 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 no. If you, if you want to find yourself, begin with God. Don't, don't go out to, to, to India and go out to the desert somewhere and do, sit and cross-legged, hugging trees and, you know, <laughs> smoking stuff. You know, no, no, no. Get, get in touch with God. Your creator, he knows you. 
your thoughts that are far off. He knows what you're going to say before you say it. He knows how you will choose. He knows everything that there is to know about you. Get in touch with God. Get in touch with God. And, and here's what I say, that the better that you know God, the better you will know your best self. And the better that you know your best self, the better you can recognize and call out the best in others. You see that? You see how it flows? The better that you know God, the better you will know your best self. And the better that you know your best self, the better you can recognize and call out the best in others. And really, when you become the best version of yourself, you actually become the best version of yourself when you submit yourself to the Holy Spirit and work on things that people cannot take away from you. Work on things in your own life that people cannot take away from you. Like what? Like your prayer life? Like your mindset? Like your godly character? Like your personality? Like your skills? Like your kindness or your generosity? Like the management of your time and the management of your money? Work on things that people cannot take from you, if you really want to be your best self, work on what people cannot take away. Work on your prayer life, your mindset, your godly character, your personality, your skills, your kindness, your generosity, and your management of your time and your money. And you know what I've discovered in life? Because I want you to have discernment when it comes to relationships. Because if the devil wants to really mess your life up, he will mess up your relationships. That's why it is so keenly important for you to have discernment in relationship. Who comes into your world? If the devil can't stop you, he will add somebody to you who is from him and you can't recognize it because they look good, but they will tear you up on the inside. They will mess up how you feel about yourself. And so you have to have discernment in relationships. I, I know that many of you wish that you had heard this, this message maybe 20, 30 years ago. <laughs> but here's what I found over the years. I couldn't teach it to you 20 or 30 years ago because I didn't know it myself. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the thing that we don't even realize about our, our own children, children think that their parents know everything, but they don't realize uh, children are watching their parents grow up while they're trying to raise their children. Because if you had to go and do it all over again, you would do some things differently because you learn along the journey and they don't realize that it's an experiment and you know that while you're growing up and they think that mama knows everything and daddy knows everything no 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 they they trying to they trying to figure this thing out that they haven't raised anybody as children before it's it's an experiment for them so they're learning in the process but you know i've discovered that there are some mean people in this world low down dirty tell somebody i know that person i know them i know <laughs> i pray you don't live with them i really do <laughs> But there are some mean people in this world. Here's what I've discovered, though. Mean people don't have a problem with others. They have a problem with themselves because they ultimately have a problem with God. Mean people have a problem not really with others. They have a problem with themselves ultimately because they have a problem with God. When you find mean people, they have a problem with God. They have a problem with God. Practically every atheist, practically every atheist had a bad relationship with his own daddy and they couldn't receive the fatherhood of God. You check it out. Check out the, the background of every atheist. They had no father or a bad relationship with father and so it didn't allow them to know how to receive the love of God the father because of their own bad example with their own father uh, so mean people they, they they don't have a real problem with others they have a problem with themselves ultimately because they have a problem with God but outside of your relationship with God your relationship with self is the most important one that you will ever have I love the words of, of professor Richard Feynman who said that the more you know the more you will realize how much you don't know. And the less you know, the more you think you know everything. He says, knowledge is humbling, ignorance is arrogant. My, you ought to screenshot that. You ought to know, I know some people like, <laughs> you know that. But the more you know, the more you realize how much you don't know. And the less you know, the more you think you know everything. Knowledge is humbling, ignorance is arrogant. And this is why I believe that the Bible tells us in 1 John 4 20 
that if someone says, I love God, but hates their, their fellow uh, believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people that we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? Now, here's the truth that I deduce out of that, is that how you are with people shows where you are with God. How you are with people shows where you are with God. How you are with people shows where you are with God. Do you know what often causes people to have a problem with God? It is that God does not meet their expectations. He doesn't come when they want him to come. And he doesn't do what they want him to do when they want him to do it. I mean, God is not a genie. He's not a, a robot. So they get disappointed, not by what they find in God, but by what they expect it to find. So they are disappointed because someone died and they prayed that they would be restored. They get disappointed because they lost a job, they lost an opportunity, they lost a relationship, uh, they experienced rejection, they were traumatized, they had an accident. You know, they, they lost something, they, they experienced hurt, and they were dealing with the hurt and with the hang-up, and they're like, God, if you, will, if you love me, you wouldn't have let this happen. See, they had an expectation that, God, if you love me, this wouldn't have happened to me. That if, if, if you really loved me, God, you wouldn't have let mama die. You wouldn't have let my child die. You wouldn't have let my spouse leave me. If, if you love me, and then they have a problem with God because God didn't come when they wanted him to and how they wanted him to respond in their life. So now they have a problem with God. But here's what I want you to understand according to the word of the Lord, that true faith is not rooted and established in God because God meets all of your expectations. Truth True faith emerges amid crisis in your life. That's how you know that there's a God so that when somebody does die, that the God of God who loves you, he's the God of all comfort, that puts his arms around you and that somehow brings an assurance on the inside of you to let you know everything is going to be all right. You're going to make it through this. You're going to have a testimony. You're going to live beyond the divorce. You'll make it outside of this bankruptcy. I got you, baby. I got you. You, it's where the genuineness of your faith is not proven by the peaceableness of no trouble in your life. But it, it's revealed when there is trouble in your life and God holds you in the midst of the storm and proves and demonstrates his love to us in a magnificent way. That's not my idea. That's the word of the Lord. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6 through 8, notice this. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though, even though, even though you must endure. You must endure. You must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. These trials, the trouble that you're having, will show that your faith is genuine genuine it is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold though your faith is far more precious than mere gold so when your faith remains strong through many trials it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world you love him even though you've never seen him though you do not see him now you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious inexpressible joy I told you, it's not the evidence of God's presence in your life that you have no trouble. His evidence comes, is that when trouble is on every hand and you haven't lost your mind, that you're dealing with stuff that should have broken you. I mean, it should have traumatized your life. You should have been in a dark room with a straitjacket on, mumbling to yourself, banging your head against the wall. But God, but God, but God. But God, but, hey, but God. Thank you, Jesus. The thing that I want you to see is that relationships are the currency of life. Relationships, they're the currency of life. They're the thing that bring meaning to your life. You've got to have somebody to, uh, to enjoy it with. You don't have to be married, but you need a friend. You need a friend. You, do need, you need to have somebody. And when something good happens to you, who do you tell? You got to tell somebody. You need somebody. 
When you get frustrated, you need somebody to say, you know what that crazy child of mine did. You just need somebody. Yours too? You need somebody. You need somebody. You need, you just, and, and you don't need a crowd. You don't need a crowd. In, in, in fact, your privacy is a, is a superpower. Don't vent to the world of people that don't care anything about you. Why would you pour your whole heart out to people on social media that don't give a flip about you and you're just giving them ammunition that when you get well to remind you of when you were down? Relationships, though, are the currency of life. You have to understand that we are called. We are called to love people. We are called to serve people. And we are called to share Jesus with people. And in, in order oftentimes to share Jesus with people, you have to befriend them to win them. We, we are called to love people. We are called to serve people. And we are called to share Jesus with people. We have to win them, train them, and send them. It's a process. God has a plan. He's trying to win people, train them, and then send them. That's true discipleship. It's to win them, train them, send them. And that's the process of life. You have to be able to share Jesus with people in your school and on your job and in your neighborhood without being weird. Help me, Holy Ghost. May I just say to you that the anointing makes you wise, not weird. Don't, don't, don't become, uh, you know, I, I don't ever, you know, I have, I've had to prophesy to people that didn't understand anything about God. And I couldn't have my eyes going in the back of my head and start shaking, you know, because that, that would have weirded them out. So I've got to look at them very conversationally without ever raising my voice. But I'd ever put it on the preacher voice and said, bless God. No, 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 no. You ought to best be able to prophesy to them and speak the word of the Lord in, in a way that it is the wisdom of God. It is the anointing of God. It is the divine prophetic timing of the Lord that lets them know this is a God thing. How could you know that? I prophesied to professors. And, and then one of them asked me, they said, you must be clairvoyant. It's, you call it whatever you want to call it. But it is the Lord. And, and, and I was able to be received because I didn't come off as weird. The anointing makes you wise, not weird. Now, can I give you another little tip of wisdom about relational discernment? Mistreating people and then avoiding communication with them is not protecting your peace it is avoiding accountability. Let me just say that again. When you mistreat people and then cut off communication with them, you're not protecting your peace, you're avoiding accountability. You need to talk about it. And if you don't have the hard conversations, you'll have a hard relationship. It's, it's just the way that life works. Now. In discerning relationships, relationships are spatial. You don't give all relationships the same level of proximity to your life. You don't. I mean, your children have a different uh, proximity. I mean, they can come in and open up your refrigerator, but you don't just want just anybody just walking in your house and walking up to your refrigerator and opening the door. There's some privileges that come from being a child in the house, doesn't it? So we have to realize that relationships are spatial. They, 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 have, they have different meanings and proximities. Notice uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 16. It says, don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. We're the temple of the living God. Now listen, we can work in the same place with ungodly people. We can go to school with ungodly people. You can live in the same neighborhood with ungodly people. But our fellowship and our communion 
has to be different because our purpose is different. Communion and, and, and fellowship. Uh, fellowship is a participation that involves intercourse, and not, not necessarily in the sexual way, but in the way of discourse. There must be an exchange. When you're in fellowship with people, there is, uh, there is a certain discourse that you have with each other. Uh, when you are in communion uh, with a person, communion is a partnership that involves communication. And so it's these, the things that really unite us in fellowship and communion has to be commonality in purpose. Purpose. It has to be a purpose. So you can, you can work together, you can go to school together, but we don't enjoy ourselves the same way they enjoy themselves. I don't mean that we can't go to a ball game, and I don't mean that we can't, uh, you know, uh, uh, go to a concert and, and, and sit with somebody who may not know Jesus. Maybe it is our way of befriending them so that we can win them, but keep, always keep aware of your purpose. Jesus had associations with sinners, but he never participated in their sin. He had fellowship with them, but he did not participate in their sin because he was clear of his purpose he was clear of his purpose so purpose keeps us on the right road that here's another relational discernment that I want to give you that if you love somebody tell them in their love language because oftentimes people's hearts are broken because of the words that are unspoken in their life Sometimes the words that hit the hardest are the ones that are never heard. The words, I love you. The words, I'm proud of you. The words, I respect you. The words, I'm sorry that this happened to you. I'm sorry for what I did. Sometimes the words that are never heard hit the hardest. Ask God, Lord, show me in my relationships the words that need to be heard in order to be healthy because if you're not heard you're not healthy there's something in the hearing that is connected to your health and let me say this to you you can discern whether people are for you or for themselves you want to know how I got a wonderful quote from Thomas Sowell I want you to get it here it is he says that when when you want to help people you tell them the truth when you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. Ooh. I mean, this is a discernment wisdom key here. That when you really want to help people, you tell them the truth. But when you want to help yourself, you tell them what they want to hear. You have to be careful when you have people around you that are just telling you what you want to hear. That doesn't help you. That doesn't help you. You need to always keep some people around you that can tell you the truth about yourself. You do. But you realize this, that people that are trying to help themselves, those people that if you don't give them what they want, they abandon you. But here's the, here's the key. People don't abandon people that they love. People abandon people that they were using. Ooh. They don't abandon people that they love. They abandon people that they were using and when you now no longer become of any use to them because your light has turned on and you see it sometimes it is the light that exposes the works of darkness and once you see the darkness don't bring that mess in here like I'm finished up you, you, you got to take that to someone I'm, I'm hip to what you're doing now I know what you're doing I, I, I was born at night I wasn't born last night <laughs> are we helping anybody today But just take, take the courage to have the, the hard conversations in some of your relationships so that you don't have to keep dealing with hard relationships. And, and, and just realize this, you're going to lose some. I mean, if you play sports, you're gonna, you win some, you lose some. I mean, it's the way that life is. You, you, know, you, 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 you keep doing it, you, you invest, you win some, you lose some. It's, it's, it's a process of life. It's normal to life. Don't, don't think that you've, you've done something and then sucking your thumb in the, in the corner, crying your eyeballs out and all of that. You know, it's, it's normal to life. You win some, you lose some. 
and rejection is honestly a form of God's protection over your life. I'm going to give you three keys here. God generally allows people to reject you for three reasons. Number one, either they are not good for you. They are not good for you. Number two, they are not good to you. Or number three, they are not good for what God is doing in you or has planned for you. So sometimes God will just cut people off because they're not good for where you're going. I mean, he, he will cause them to reject you because they're either not good for you, they're not good to you, or they are not good for what God is doing in you or has planned for you. You may not understand it at the moment, but God can see things that you can't see. He can see beyond the bend in the road. He can see. And a great part of your relational discernment is that you don't have to react to everything that happens. Wisdom is just knowing what to ignore. You don't have time to have all of your energy drained by responding to every piece of foolishness because you will never get finished responding because there's so much foolishness out there. I don't have time to have an opinion on everybody's crazy comment and post on so I don't have time, I don't have time to get my blood boiling trying to have an opinion about something crazy. And I love the words of, of Dr. Tony Evans that said that one of Satan's most effective ways of ruling over you is to get you to fight the wrong enemy. To get you to fight the wrong enemy. Please understand that happy people are not hating people and hating people are not happy people. Anybody that's a hater, they're not happy. I'm just telling you. Anybody that has an issue with you, this jealousy, they're, they're not happy. It, it, jealousy is counting other people's blessings more than you count your own. Learn to count your own many blessings. See what the Lord has done here. It, it'll, it'll shift you. I'm telling you, it will shift you. Can I give you another piece of relational discernment? In a relationship, someone can be angry with you and still love you. I know when you are experiencing their anger, it doesn't feel like love. But the very fact that you're angry, if, if you didn't care about them, you wouldn't waste your time getting angry over them. But it hurts you when somebody that you love and that you know that this is not your best self, that hurts and you can be angry with somebody because you love them. If you see that they are not living up to their potential, it, it angers you because you believe in them and you see something in them better than what they are producing and showing you and showing the world. But just because somebody is angry with you doesn't mean that they love you. In fact, it is a fact, it is the evidence that they do love you. If the love were gone, you could do what you want to do. That's a, you reached a dangerous place in a relationship when your behavior and your words no longer affect them. They, had, they, oh, they, they, have, they, had, they got a wall. They, they, they going into a zone now. Oh, it's over. It's over long before you consult an attorney. It's already over. Oh, it's, it's over. It's already over. When they no longer even get angry, you can do what you want to do. You can live your separate life and do whatever you want to do. Just keep it out of my face. It's over. They have, they have cut things to protect themselves. They've cut the nerves to, to, to be able to control the pain. Does that make sense to you? But when people are still angry, they've not lost their love. Their anger is a sign that the love is still there. They still love you. They still love you. But there's, it's like you've got too much in you for you to be living this way. Happy people get angry sometimes. You can be happy. I'm a happy man. I get angry sometimes. You can be happy and angry. I, I'm, so, I'm so glad that the Bible, you know, I don't have to put on a smiley face all the time. No, 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 sometimes there are, because there are other two-legged human beings in the world. <laughs> Touch somebody and say, I know that person, I know them. <laughs> but this is why the Apostle Paul, right into the church at Ephesus, said these words to us in Ephesians 4, 26, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry. He says, uh, be angry for just, a, for just a little while and then let it pass. Let it go. I mean, uh, give, give five minutes, vent for five minutes and let it go. 
Say everything you need to say within those five minutes and let it go. Don't, don't carry this to bed with you because then you're going to get up with an attitude. And then this is where the wedge really begins. And so it says be angry but don't sin by letting it harbor and fester because it'll destroy the very vessel that carries it and the very person that you're angry with, they're still going out doing that foolishness and not even thinking about you. So it's like protect yourself. Be angry for just a little while, but don't let the sun go down. Don't, don't let it get dark. Before it gets dark, you know, just you know, process that. Talk to Jesus. Talk to somebody. Pray. Read a scripture. Turn on some praise and worship music. You know, go out and hug a tree. Whatever you need to do, you know. <laughs> And just, and just breathe and just let this thing go. Just, you know, get in your tub and take your nice bath and put your candles on and some aromatherapy, whatever it, it takes to calm you down. Have some chamomile tea. <laughs> just, you have to breathe and, and just bring all of that, that, that energy down and just let go of the things that anger you. Can I give you another relational discernment here? Anger is an emotional punishment that you place on yourself for somebody else's behavior. It's an emotional punishment that you place on yourself for somebody else's behavior. Anger. Isn't that a terrible thing? You punishing yourself for somebody else's behavior. But here's what I want you to understand. Conflict is normal to life. It's just normal to life. Conflict is the opportunity to strengthen a relationship. That's all. It's the opportunity to strengthen a relationship. You've got conflict, that means that some things need to be worked out. Conflict is an opportunity to strengthen a relationship. And Bill Johnson says that real faith does not deny the existence of a problem, but real faith denies the problem a place of influence in your life. It, deny, it's, it's not, it doesn't deny the existence of it. It's just saying, you won't influence me. You don't matter to that level. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's real. I understand that it's real. But I'm not going to allow you to have that as, a, as a, the problem to become a real influence in my life. And I love something that Dr. Nicole Lepera says. She says, healthy relationships don't feel like fairy tales. They're built through uncomfortable conversations emotional vulnerability and grace for each other's humanness healthy relationships take work and the willingness to step outside of our ego can I see anybody today that's been married for 20 years or more raise your hand 30 years or more 40 years or more Ooh, go, give these people a hand oh my god my god Woo. Whether you're celebrating 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years of marriage or more, what you're really celebrating is not 50 years of marriage or 40 years of marriage, 30, 20 years of marriage. What you're celebrating is 20, 30, 40, or 50 years of forgiveness, of tolerance, of being able to move past big mistakes. All of the folks that have been married, will you, can you testify that you, this is really what this thing is about? I'm celebrating forgiveness, I'm celebrating tolerance, I'm celebrating being able to move past a big mistake, how you messed up money, how you messed up emotions and relationships. That's what you, oh, this is grown up church today. This, no, 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 really, I, I'm trying to help you with discernment in, in, in relationships, this relational discernment that helps us that when you when you do that you're celebrating your ability to be able to forgive one another your your ability to be able to tolerate the differences that the nuances the uh, the idiosyncrasies that get up underneath your skin of the things that they do of when they leave hair on the counter and and the, the toilet seat and and all of these you know and, and the way they breathe while they eat and you know. <laughs> And so when you're celebrating, you, you're celebrating what you've had to tolerate, that you've had to have noise reductions to, to deal with their snoring. And you, you, you're celebrating forgiveness and tolerance and, and uh, being able to get over big mistakes. 
it's, it's a real celebration, but if I had to give you a mathematical word equation, I would say this to you. Character plus loyalty is greater than money. I mean, it really is. Character plus loyalty is greater than money. Character plus loyalty is greater than money, material things. Character plus loyalty is greater than money. I'm just trying to share with you uh, relational discernment that I didn't learn overnight. But it can help us. And I want you to know your spouse is not your enemy. The devil is the enemy to your marriage, and he will use whomever and whatever he can to destroy. Because remember, he knows that your happiness is connected to your relationships. So if he wants to mess with your happiness, he affects somebody that you care about. He begins to go after them. But can I get, where are the single people? Raise your hand, all the single people. Ooh, let me give you a word of advice. I'm so glad that you're here. You'll find the best people to be able to love by the people that are doing the things that you love. Find them doing the things that you love. They often make the best relationships. They're doing the things that you love. You know where I met Dr. Nina? I was teaching the Bible in my high school. My schoolmate, Charles Blackshear, who's pastoring now, was sort of my evangelist. And he went to this girl and invited her to the club where I was teaching. And she had a love for Jesus. And I'm there loving Jesus and teaching in my own public high school. And we meet while I'm already operating in my destiny. I didn't meet her in a nightclub and have to get her converted. She already loved Jesus. I, I didn't get her off a stripper pole. <laughs> Any and trying to get her sanctified. Good luck with that. I mean, maybe that's your mission, but I, my name is not Hosea. <laughs> you better find somebody that's doing something that you love. Uh, and now, now your mate might be a part of your mission field. I'm not saying you, you, have to, you have to understand your own role of where God has called you. But can I tell you in your, in your relational journey as well, I want to give you another, can I give you some relational discernment? Trust your family and your friends who know you and know you. Who know you. I'm telling you, one, 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 of, one of my aunts, saw me with another girl that was not Dr. Nina before we married. She rarely spoke to me, but she called, she called me. She said, that's not the one. <laughs> you, you, you have to have people that K-N-O-W you and then people who N-O you. You always need trusted family members and trusted friends who K-N-O-W you and who also N-O you. You need those two kinds of people in your life. People that know you. They know the character, the quality of who you are. And then people that out of their love for you and their wisdom can tell you, no, no, that's not God's best for you. That's not who you are. You need people at times when you may be questioning your own identity. People that K-N-O-W you and people who also N-O-U. It's not enough to just K-N-O-W. God K-N-O-W's, he knows us, he knows our thoughts afar off, but he also tells you no. I remind you that God not only orders our steps, he also orders our stops. No, you've come thus far no more. There are some doors that God will shut and say, this is not it. This is not your lane, this is not the one. God. God knows us. Do you have the right people in there to give you your N.O.s in, in life? 
It's amazing. Because you see, real love does not remain silent while people are living dangerously or they're about to make a terrible mistake. It'll give you a no, a sanctified no, a resolute no. And I would say this too, that you must, in your relationships, always be careful about what you give your time and attention to, what consumes your attention. Because anything that consumes your attention also competes for your affection. It can become a mistress to your relationship. I've taught this for many years that before you marry someone, look at their faces. In, in the Hebrew, they don't even have a singular word for face. They have faces because you don't just have one face. You have a different face with different people. Before you marry someone, look at, your, at the family background, the F, the family background. The A, look at their attitude. The C, their compatibility, spiritually, intellectually, financially, your compatibility. The E is your experiences from the past, you know, the trauma that they've been through. You don't just marry who a person is, you marry the, the, the trauma that they've been through. Because you can say something and then they'll, they'll, they'll react. And then S is the skills that they bring to the table. The skills that they bring to the table. Before you marry someone, look at their family background, their attitude. They can be cute, but check that attitude. Check that attitude, the compatibility, the experiences from the past, and the skills that they bring to the table. And then I want you to realize this, that the surface things that uh, couples fight about are not the deeper issues that they are really dealing with. And I want to give you three of the main areas. Number one is power and control. I mean, you had an argument over just something that's so, and it's really over power and control. And number two, over closeness and care. That's love and affection. Love and affection. And then over respect and recognition. These are the three underlying things that real relationships deal with. Power and control, closeness and care, and respect and, re and recognition. And it may be over where you're going to dinner and it's coming out, but that's, it's a power struggle here. And control. It's over closeness and care. It's like, do you really love me? And let me give you these relationship killers. Number one, unforgiveness. Number two, distrust or suspicion. Number three, selfishness, narcissism. Number four, ingratitude. Number five, unkindness. Number six, external marital influence. And seven, spirit of offense. These are relationship killers. You have to be, be aware of these things that can murder your relationship. And the spirit of offense is a dangerous and tricky thing because it gives people the ability to hear things that were not said. It's amazing. May I say this to you that at the end of the day, when you die, you must be a child of God because God has no grandchildren. You'll never make it to heaven on your grandparents' relationship with God. They can pray for you, but every tub has got to sit on its own bottom. You got to have your own relationship with God. You can watch them worship. You can watch them pray. You can watch them read their Bible and cry out to God. But God has no grandchildren. You will never get into heaven by virtue of who your mama and your daddy happen to be. You got to develop your own connection with God. And that's why the moment that you, you have children, children are born dependent on you. Then they grow up and they move out. They are independent of you. And the third thing they, that we have to make sure that we get them dependent on God. Because we're going to check out. And God has no grandchildren. They're a child of God. They've got to be a child of God. And I want you to realize this. Because Christianity really is about, it is a religion that specializes in relationships. And this is why you need relational 
discernment. Because you don't even get to heaven by what you know, but by who you know. You get there by a relationship. A relationship with Jesus Christ, who himself became our sin. And he died in our stead, in our place. He died as you to pay your debt. You don't get to heaven because you've read the Bible and because you've said prayers. It's because you have relationship with Jesus. And that's why Jesus said, I'm the door. And if you come by any other means, you're a thief and a robber. You, you, you've got an illegal entrance here. And he says, you got to know me. He says, you got to come through me. He said, I'm the one who has relationship with my daddy. And if you come and you're a guest of Jesus, the son, who now becomes our elder brother because we receive him, it gives us entrance into the presence of God. You get to God not because you've learned scriptures and tried to do all of the right things. It's, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ that changes everything. It changes everything. It changes everything. And may I say this to you, that we're, we're at a critical time in history right now. Sin is running rampant in our land and God is not pleased. He's aware of everything that's happening. May I tell you that we're going to get a fresh fire of the Holy Ghost that's going to fall back into the earth. And do you know why? Has it ever dawned on you that one of the main reasons that we clean up our houses is because guess, a guest is coming. I mean, nothing starts us to cleaning in the same way than when we know a guest is coming. And that's why on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, before the Holy Ghost came, there came a mighty rushing wind to blow away some things, and then a a fire set on each of them to purge, to cleanse, to get this place ready because a guest was coming. This time he wasn't just coming just to visit every now and then. He was coming to make, take up permanent residency, to get his legal entrance into our hearts. But he had to clean up the place so the Holy Ghost could come because company is coming. When company is coming, you, you clean up the place. And when you invite Jesus to come into your heart, he's not just any company. He is royalty. He's a king's kid. And that's why he sends a fire to get us ready. My God, it's all about a relationship. It is to present us to a relationship. You have to understand this whole church more than anything else, it's a bride being adorned from her husband. We are a church. We are a relationship. This is about a relationship. It's personal. He is not the God of miracles and signs and wonders. He is the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Relationships. He's calling us. He's calling us. He's calling us. He's calling us just to be able to get our relationship right with God. Because when you get that one right, you can clean up this. You can get all of the right friendships, fellowships, communions. But it's first saying, God, I've got to be right with you. I've got to be right with you. Bow your heads for just a moment. If you're in this place, if you're watching online right now, I implore you, this thing is really about relationship with Jesus. It's about relationship with Jesus. It's not about wisdom. It's not about principles and ideas. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. At the end of the day, I've got to get you in relationship with Jesus. It's to win you, train you, send you to be able to help other people to come to know Jesus. If you're in this place, 
you're not in right standing with Jesus Christ, you got to have a hard conversation and say, Lord, I've missed the mark. I have, this is Hamartia. That's, I've missed the mark. I've missed the target, God. I've, I've done some wrong things. But God loves us. He can be angry with us over our sin, but he loves us. He said, well, I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to abandon you. You've done it again and again and again. I'm going to invite you to get up out of your seat if you're out of fellowship with God and meet me here at this altar just to restore your relationship. It's a picture of a loving father that says, I love you, I love you, I love you. Just get up out of your seat. Just come, come, just come. Say, Lord, I want to have my relationship right with you. I want to be right with you, Jesus. I want to be right. I've messed up a lot of relationships because I got some work to do with me. I got some stuff to do right here with me. I got some stuff to do right here with me. Mother's prayers are being answered right now. Right now, right now, right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Sons and daughters. My God, that's... Some wife is rejoicing right now. A girlfriend is rejoicing right now. Somebody's son and daughter saying, Lord, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. My, my, my God. My God, my God, my God. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. They're still coming. I heard in the Holy Ghost today the Lord calling for the repeat offenders. There's, some, there's a hang up. Jesus, came, he was hung up for your hang up. The repeat offenders, you, you, you keep having to come back over and over and over again and he's patient, merciful and kind. I want to invite you to come on. If you, you know who you are, you're always back over in the same thing over and over and over again and the devil has told you that this is just who you are and you'll never be able to change it. The devil is a liar. Come on, come on, all of the repeat offenders today. God loves you. God loves you. He refuses to give up on you because he loves you. He refuses to give up on you because he loves you. Come on today, come on. My, 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 my. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. She come out of her door, she kidding. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Heaven is rejoicing right now. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Glory, 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 glory. Glory to the Lamb of God. All praise and glory and honor and majesty and dominion and power be unto him, O oh God. We worship you. God, we give you glory and honor for what you do, Lord, by the power of your own spirit and being able to redeem fallen mankind. God, we love you. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for being long-suffering with us. God, we honor you today. We thank you today. Thank you, Lord, for still honoring prayers of people that died in the faith. And now, Lord, we see the fruit of the harvest of their prayer coming today in the name of Jesus. Yes! Yes! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And everybody we hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, Click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.